Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to ADHD for Smartass Women. Before I reduce, <laughs> before I reduce our guest, I am so sorry, <laughs> Sarah. It's not usually this bad up front. I, I love it. I do it all the time. Before I introduce our guest, however, I wanted to remind you that if you are interested in joining me for my free five-day workshop called How to Fall in Love with Your ADHD Brain, you may join the waitlist at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash I love my brain, all one word. So let's get started with episode 109 of ADHD for Smartass Women. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to Sarah Geese, Sarah, guys. Ah, sorry, I knew I'd get it wrong. I actually had that highlighted to ask you before. Okay, I am going to introduce you to Sarah Guys. Sarah is an award-nominated Chicago actor, originally from San Antonio, who got her BFA degree for acting at the University of Southern California. We know it as USC out here in California. She's worked a thousand different jobs and gigs because she experiences intense FOMO, fear of missing out. So in addition to acting, she's dipped her toes into teaching, writing, directing, podcasting, bartending. Every single actress needs to be a bartender, right? And actor. (laughs) And coaching. She is currently an ensemble member with Interobang Theater Project and has performed in numerous shows with different companies around Chicago. Her performance in Interobang Theater Project's production of the one-woman show The Amish Project in 2016 was nominated for Best Solo Performance at the 2017 Joseph Jefferson Awards. In addition to theater, she has appeared in several web series, films, commercials, and audiobooks. She currently works as an executive function coach for Effective Artistry and is the host producer of the ADHD Artist Podcast, which explores and celebrates the lives of artists with ADHD. Sarah, welcome. How did I do? Did I get all that out right? You did so great. (laughs) And thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, no, I am so happy that you're here. So I want to hear all about everything you do, which in true ADHD fashion is a hell of a lot. (laughs) But can we start by talking about your ADHD diagnoses first? Absolutely. So I was diagnosed pretty early uh, when I was about eight years old. And it was just a diagnosis by my primary care doctor. And I didn't get a lot of information All I knew was that my grades were suffering and I was like having trouble, like not hugging my friends in the line and and, like getting, you know, distracted and fidgeting, playing with a bunch of things. And so and so they put me on um, Ritalin and that just kind of was what it was for a while. Like I, I was too young to really like understand the difference, but my teacher seemed to be happy and my parents seemed to be happy. Did your grades get better, Sarah? They did. Yeah, they got better. I think 
Yeah, people were happy. I mean, I would have crashes after school when it would start to wear off. But yeah, I mean, my teacher was thrilled. Uh, I was not fidgeting and like moving around as much, which is good. You know, um, everyone else seemed to be happy. And truthfully, I don't remember if I was happy. <laughs> I was too young. Do you remember if that was a hard time of life? I, I kind of get the sense just from your comment about you couldn't stop hugging your friends in <laughs> line that you were probably really good socially. Like you were the Pied Piper. Everybody came running to you. Yeah. Or no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was like the class clown or like the popular kid. <laughs> um, certainly not that. But yeah, I was very social. I had lots of friends. I was I was doing sports. I was doing um, performing arts stuff. I was like performing in this little singing and dancing group from a very young age, probably around then, actually. So yeah, I was very social. I, I like to move around a lot. And apparently in school, that's uh, that's tough. Because then all yeah, the other kids don't like it. You know, doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then what happened? Yeah, so then um, I stayed on medication through um, sometime in high school. And I switched to Adderall at some point. And then I got to college and had to kind of reevaluate everything. You know, I moved from Texas to, to California. And I feel like people can probably relate to this. Like that first year of college for me was a nightmare because all the adjusting and like there's a new living space, there's new classes you have to keep up with, you know, and and sign up for. And, and, in and then general, you have to get yourself fed and the laundry done. And yeah, yeah. like who knew, right? Um, it's just, right. You typically so, do poorly the first year of college. Exactly. And I certainly did. So I played around with my medications then and, uh, did okay. I, I managed, you know, I, I did pretty well. I'm a really hard worker. So <laughs> it's like, I'll get it done no matter what. Can I ask you a question? Um, so in order to get into USC, mm -hmm. you must have done pretty well in school. So just being on the Ritalin and the Adderall, being on the stimulant medication really had a huge effect on your grades? You know, it's hard to say for high school, honestly, because it gets a little fuzzy. I can't remember like if I was taking it all the time or what I was taking. But yeah, USC is very hard to get into. I had a high school counselor my freshman year laugh when I told her that was my goal was to get into USC and uh, proved her wrong. And she was very proud. Oh my gosh, she laughed? Yeah, it was kind of um, the school I was going to, like nobody got into schools like that. There's a public school in, in Texas. And uh, I don't know, I guess it was just surprising. So I worked my butt off. You know, I, I worked my butt off and the medications helped. Um, but I have to be honest, like part of it was because I went to a performing arts school ah. and was doing like musical theater and artistic things and surrounded by artistic people, creative people. And then I got into USC for acting. So you have to have the academics for sure, but you also have to audition to get in. And they only took like, I think it was like 11 people that year um, to the BFA program. So part of it was grades. Part of it was just acting. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I mean, I know kids that you know, got into UCLA or or even my son, you know, mm -hmm. who's at NYU. And yeah. in huge part, it's because of his gift in the arts. Yeah. So, yeah, which it should be. It should be like that. Right. You know? Yeah, that's how I learn best, <laughs> you know, when I'm when I have some sort of artistic endeavor. So, yeah. So in college, I told this to Eric Tivers when I was on his podcast, but uh, eventually, like Adderall started to be a thing that um, it started to get to me and the managing of it didn't go super well. I had access to support groups and stuff, but I didn't really do that much for myself in that way. And, um, okay. The thing about Adderall and college kids yeah. is that, you know, people want their connections to any sort of uppers, any sort of drugs that they mm -hmm. can get. And so I got a phone call from, or I got like a voice message from someone when I first started, like freshman year, 
who found out that I had ADHD and like a subscription or uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, prescription. Well, <laughs> yeah, I subscribed to Adderall, um, <laughs> no, a prescription for Adderall. And um, he left me this voicemail being like, hey, so I'm doing the show tonight. And and I uh, heard that you have access to Adderall. And my doctor said I should probably use some before the show tonight because I'm not feeling great. And I was mortified. Like, mm. like mortified for so many different reasons. And so I just basically never told anyone else in college, um, including my teachers, that I took medication or even that I had ADHD. So eventually I I stopped taking medication for a while, which was fine. I, I had other coping strategies, but... Um, and why? Why did you decide to stop? So it got to the point with Adderall where... You know, it is a stimulant. And this is, I mean, this may be controversial to talk about, but I started having um, some issues with like addiction from Mm -hmm. it, you know, and um, almost to the point where I was like abusing it, where I would like, you know, take an Adderall and maybe do a little bit of homework, but then I would go like drink all night, you know, and which is really bad because it, you know, it exacerbates that. And so it just got kind of out of control and I got really in my own head about things and um, the... So you actually feel, felt worse over time yeah, and yeah. felt like maybe this isn't helping me as much as it was before. Exactly. Exactly. And I and I was just too stressed out to deal with that. And and so I, I went off of it and I had a gre- really good support system at the time. I was, I think I was a junior in college and um, and so I, I went off of it. I've, I've been on... Uh, certain medications since then, but just on and off. And I'm still, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing battle for, for a lot of us, you know, it's still trying out new medications that doesn't work. Let's try something else. Let's try not being on medication. You know, um, I don't know if that's your experience, but that's certainly been mine. <laughs> yeah, I have not been successful at all. I think I'm one <laughs> of that, you know, part of that 20 or 20 to 30% where it just, the symptoms are worse than the medication. And I I wish there was some, you know, Nirvana medication for me that I could just take and, you know, ah, yeah. everything would the magic open pill. up. And, <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. We're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty much my ADHD story. So all along, from as long as you can remember, you knew that you had ADHD. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they prescribed medication. Sounds like they didn't do much beyond that. Mm-hmm. At some point, you decide that I feel worse on the medication than when I'm on it versus when I'm off it. So you get off of the medication. How were you actually managing your ADHD? Or was it just something that was out there and you weren't really paying attention to it? Great question. Yeah. I think there were times where I was more focused on it than others. Like that first year of college in particular, I was very much, I was struggling so hard. And I was like, why am I struggling this hard? It doesn't seem like everybody else is struggling this hard. Did you know that it was ADHD? Had you connected all of these kind of executive function challenges with your ADHD at that point? For the most part, yes. I think... I kind of leaned into it because it made me feel better. (laughs) And I'm also like a, you know, go online and go down rabbit holes. And I was like, does ADHD (laughs) cause this? Yeah, exactly. You know, I I almost called myself that. And I was like, okay, not like a researcher, researcher, but I do research. And uh, so I think I kind of went down some rabbit holes in terms of that and was like, okay, is this because of ADHD or anxiety or depression, which I also have, and and kind of just trying, I'm very fascinated by the human mind, as a lot of us are. (laughs) But, uh, and that's part of the reason I wanted to be an actor. But yeah, I think I would do all this research and then be like, okay, so what helps? You know, Mm. like what, what can I do to make that better? Okay. So note taking, great. So I'm going to record this and, you know, taking any strategies that could possibly work and trying them out. Okay. So you were really active in trying to figure out, okay, how does my brain best work? Right. And what did you discover? Were there things that actually did work really well for you? So yeah, the, the big ones are exercise 
like yeah. cardio specifically. Lifting weights doesn't do it as much, although I do that nowadays for other reasons. But if I'm not like moving my body, I almost describe it like it's like my brain forgets that it has a body. <laughs> you totally. know, that there's a totally body relate. attached, right? And uh, and so my brain just keeps going, and it's like this is the only thing that matters, and I have to figure this out, blah blah blah. And then as soon as I do, even like five minutes of cardio, I'm like, oh, oh, well, there's a nice perspective. Okay, I can I can breathe again. <laughs> So exercise helps you then to get out of your brain where you're Mm -hmm. thinking, 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 and kind of attach your head back to your body, right? To to remember that, oh, I have a body and that's how I feel better if I get back into my body and get out of my head. Exactly. Yeah. It it sounds kind of silly to say out loud, but that's exactly what I think of. I'm just like, yep, have to have to keep that balance there. Think really hard, work out. (laughs) Anything else that you noticed that really worked well for you? Yeah, actually. So, um, and I didn't discover this till a bit later, but mindfulness meditation. Yes. Have you done mindfulness meditation? Is that something? Yes, absolutely. I'm a huge believer in it. And I'm sorry, with neuroplasticity, I Mm -hmm. think it's probably one of the most, I I would agree, exercise is number one. But then after that, I think it's mindfulness. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me your experience, what happened. Yes, Oh, this is so hard because I'm an interviewer too. And so I'm always like, oh, I want to know about your experience. But yes, I will. (laughs) I'll talk about mine. I think the first time I discovered mindfulness was like a therapist recommended it um, in my early 20s. And she sent me this UCLA mindfulness meditation website. Yeah, well, they have the huge program over there. Right. uh, What's her name? Zolwinski? Oh. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. I can. Okay, I, yeah. I know. I was like, I'm not. I'm not going to be able to come up with the name. Um, but yeah, there's these great meditations that are like for beginners. And I'll tell you what. I started this in my early 20s. I'm 31 now, and I still do her breathing meditation. That's five minutes long, every day. At least every time I perform or I have to be around people, like any time where I could, where there's a potential for me to have like some sort of anxiety, I do that beforehand. And I kind of use it as a tool. All I need is five minutes. And I just refocus on my breath. So I'm I'm allowing myself to have all these thoughts because the thoughts are going to happen, they're going to be there. And then I'm just letting that happen and coming back to the breath. And for some reason, that like totally transformed my life. I hear this over and over again. So this mindfulness meditation that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Is it from Lydia Zylowska? I you know? think so. I could probably look it up. Do you want me to look it up right now? That would be great. You know what I would love is the link. So it, is it like on a YouTube? Absolutely. Is it yeah. a YouTube thing? No, it's actually, it's their website. They actually have an app now. Um, so I don't even have to go to the website, but I'll definitely send you the link. I'm just- I'm Definitely. And I will put that in the show notes. I would love that. Diana Winston. Oh, Diana Winston. Okay. Okay. So we will put that in the show notes. Awesome. I'll send you that link. I also want to mention the mindfulness prescription for adult ADHD, and it's by Lydia Zylowska, Mm. MD, with Dan Siegel. She was a co-founder and faculty member at UCLA's Mindfulness Awareness Research Center, and she led the first study of mindfulness training in ADHD. It's amazing. But I am really curious what yours looks like, too. I always love the idea of simple little things that we can do. And so the fact that you've got an app and whenever you feel you know anxious, you can just go to your app and say, OK, I'm going to do this five minute thing. And then look, you stuck with it over how many years? Oh, yeah. I mean, at eight at least. Wow. So and in the same one, it's just like I just uh, tune back in and, you know, I would say for people who haven't tried this, like, don't be alarmed if the first couple times are terrible and it makes you like more anxious because I don't know if this happened to you, Tracy, but it certainly happened to me where I was like trying it the first time and I was like, okay, Sarah, focus, focus. You have to relax. You have to relax, you know, like, which of course is- I can't even sit still. What are you talking about? What's wrong with you? Why can't you relax? Uh, (laughs) But after a while- you really start to build that habit and you get better at it and you can do it. You can tap into it more quickly. 
So I, I think it's it's just it's got such good short term and long term benefits. And it's really helped me. And the thing is, you don't even have to be, you know, I always thought, oh, you have to be sitting down or, mm-hmm. you know, with your knee, legs crossed and like, you know, I do it when I'm walking. Yeah. I mean, you could do it at any time. I look, you know, I've got this, this some um, closet door that kind of sits right in front of my office. And sometimes I will literally just look at the doorknob. And that's what I focus mm. on is the doorknob. All I have to do is focus on the doorknob. I mean, there's so many hacks that you can use to make mindfulness work for you. So yeah. it's not kind of this one size fits all thing. Absolutely. I mean, there's also such great stuff out there now, like the Headspace app is amazing. I mean, it's got like mindfulness meditations for when you're doing anything, (laughs) when you're doing chores, when you're, you know, um, about to have a difficult conversation. It's like, it's so great. Um, And oh, here's, this is one of my tricks that I love. uh, And I don't remember where I got it from, but it takes seconds and it helps me with mindfulness. So Listen for the farthest away sound. And you just focus on that. Hmm. And then it like, it triggers something in your brain, right? That's like searching for something and taking it out of and making it about something else. The other trick I have is um, name five red things in the room <laughs> or search for, right? And it just, it takes you not just into the present, but into your environment. All it does is take you out of that thinking, thinking brain, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're paying attention to something else and you can't do both at the same time. Yep. Exactly. I love it. Right. There's just tiny tools that like you can use in, it takes one minute of your life, you know, and they help so much. So anything else that you can think of exercise, mindfulness, any other work around? Yeah. I mean, I am like a compulsive note taker. I use, I take full advantage of the notes app on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I would be so embarrassed if somebody like read through them eventually because they just, it has everything that I do. It has like little journal entries when I'm like, I want to remember this. It has ideas for like a sketch I could write. It's got my to-do lists. It's just anything. And what I love about it is I can, I can literally do it anywhere because my phone is always with me. So I can just be like, oh, I really want to remember the name of this movie. And then I write it in my notes section, put it away. And I so I don't have to like, like focus so hard on trying to keep it in my brain. Like, please remember, please remember. (laughs) Totally. And then you can't pay attention to what the person's even saying. Exactly. You're like, okay, well, (laughs) this is all pointless. (laughs) You need to give me a break. Let me put this in my notes app so that I can actually focus on whatever else you want to say to me. (laughs) Right. Because then it's gone. Then you're like, okay, now the the note section's taken care of it and I can be here. I can be present. I'm also, I find a compulsive note taker. I just realized Mm. this. I mean, really realized this about myself that it helps me focus, but it has to be pencil and paper and it's got to be a pencil Mm. and a certain kind of pencil. And it's got to be paper that feels a certain way, but I never refer back to the notes. Like we're sitting here talking and I've got, you know, I've got your three things written down and because it helps me to focus. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Isn't it? Like even just the act of writing it down helps you remember like I do that with my lines sometimes when I'm trying to memorize like a like a long monologue, I'll just write it out. And if I can't think of something, I check it and then I write it down and there's something about it. I don't know. I feel like a lot of people use that trick, but it's it's just really helpful. I don't have to reread it. It's just the act of writing it. So that's a perfect segue to <laughs> my next question, which going which is going to start out with a comment. Okay. So I remember when I was younger. Before the age of, say, 13, I was the lead in all the school plays, all the, you know, everything. I could memorize songs. And, you know, I was the lead in plays, not just in English, but also in German. Mm. And literally, once puberty hit, I could not even remember one chorus, like even two lines to this day. I can hear a song a hundred times and I can't remember any part of it. And so I look at actors and actresses. So many of them have ADHD. And I remember when I was younger, my dad used to always tell me, (laughs) he used to always say to me, you should be on a soap opera. You should go uh, try be on a soap opera. I guess because, you know, he thought I was really dramatic, (laughs) but 
I remember even at that age thinking there was no way I could be on a soap opera. I could literally not memorize, you know, two lines of something. How do you do it? Is that just one of your genetic gifts as far as how your brain works? You can memorize? Um, certainly not me. I know a lot of people that do work like that. They just kind of absorb a script like right when they read it. That do you is, think they're ADHD? I don't know. I, I assume so. But it's it's hard to say. I, I mean, it, ADHD manifests in so many different ways. For me, it's definitely like, you know, forgetting things in the middle of me talking. And, and you know, it, it is difficult for me to process the lines that I'm reading. So, yeah, I don't really know. Um, but, but you can memorize, right? I mean, obviously, you can memorize a script. Yeah. In fact, the one woman show that I did was like the the ultimate test. <laughs> Can you memorize something? Because it was an hour, like an hour and 15 minutes of me talking. There are tricks out there, memorization tricks that I have had to use um, for myself because, you know, I'm good at some of the other things. Um in the acting profession, but that for me is is always a struggle. Um, the biggest one is um, so there's this app called Line Learner, and it basically you record your lines and the other person's lines, and it times it out, and then you can mute your lines so you can run the scene with your app, oh. which is it was so big for me um, because. You know, it, it. I learn lines pretty easily when I'm in rehearsals, when I'm up on my feet and I'm getting it in my body and I'm like looking at the other person. I learn lines well, but I cannot just look at a script and be like, OK, I know this now. So that's really helpful. And then the writing down, um, writing your lines down, if it's like a monologue or something, that's helpful. Getting it into your makes, body, too. That is makes a big so thing. much sense to me that mm -hmm. something like line learner would work because that provides the structure. Yep. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, fairly new over. I mean, I think like in the last at least like probably the last decade like that they came out with that and uh, it works <laughs> really well for me, at least. So tell me about your podcast, The ADHD Artist. Why did you start it? So, you know, I told you about in college how. I didn't tell anyone about my struggles with medications, about my ADHD, anything. And I felt very alone in that, you know, and I felt like I had to like pretend that these things weren't going on, um, that my brain was working like everyone else's. And um, Sarah, yeah. Can I ask you, did you make this concerted decision not to tell anyone because of what was going on with the medication or because there was shame around the ADHD or both? Definitely both. The the shame, you bring that, oh my gosh, shame is such a huge thing for me. And I think a lot of other people with ADHD, at least like growing up, um, I just wanted to be able to do things normally. You know, I didn't want to be held back by these, by these certain things I, I couldn't get myself to do. So, yeah, I think there was a lot of shame around it. Um, and also it's misunderstood. You know, I am great at focusing. I just have trouble figuring out what to focus on and how <laughs> to focus in on it. You know, well, I mean, I could sit there for six hours and, and be like, don't interrupt me no matter what. It's that hyper focus. Yeah. So so I was um, feeling really alone about it for a while, even after I graduated and and was, you know, out in the real world. Um, <laughs> the Did you literally world. not tell anybody? Like you wouldn't tell a boyfriend or oh, no, like I, your best friend? Yeah, I did tell like people that were close to me, but people who, yeah, people who I, who made me feel safe and that they would, they wouldn't be watching for it. I don't know if this resonates with you, but like for me, it makes me really anxious when someone like finds out that you have something like ADHD, right? And then they're like watching for it. Like, oh, is she doing that because she has ADHD? Is that why she doesn't clean up after herself? Is that why, you know what I mean? And, and so I guess I was always just like, I don't want strangers to have that power, I guess. I mean, for example, 
Like I, I was on a family vacation. This is in the last couple of years. And um, I had been talking more about my ADHD recently, like to my family and stuff. And, and we were all drinking. And um, one of my family members just that night kept being like, Sarah, focus, you know, like Sarah, in like a funny way, like Sarah, you need to focus, Sarah, hello, (laughs) and like snapping at me, you know, like trying to be funny. And I was livid. I was just like, okay, yes, it's fun. We can like laugh about ADHD. But that is like the worst thing you could possibly do to a person with ADHD, right? Because that's what we grew up like with our parents, our teachers, our peers, like everyone telling us like, why can't you just focus? Can you just focus? Hello? Um, <laughs> yeah. and, oh, it just, oh, it makes me feel nauseous just thinking about it. So yeah, yeah I would have told them I'll focus when you shut up. Yeah. <laughs> and I just kept drinking my wine instead. I was like, this will get easier in a minute. <laughs> so the whole idea behind the ADHD artist podcast was that you wanted to kind of come out yeah. and really make a statement about, okay, this is what I have and this is what it actually looks like. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly what it's like. And and letting other artists with ADHD talk about those specific things and share helpful tips. And, you know, I like to call it that I think there's like, you know, superpowers um, that come with ADHD, especially for artists. And so I just wanted to do something that would celebrate that so that if someone especially an artist is like in a situation where they're like, I can't talk about my ADHD. I don't want anyone to see it. I don't want anyone to like notice it or think uh, like something about me that I can't control like that. I just wanted to create like a safe space for us to be able to talk about that. And, um, and it's been really fun. What happened? Oh, when I started interviewing people? Well, when you came out and said, this is what I'm doing and this is who I am and this is who I want to talk to, what happened as far as with you and your feelings of shame around ADHD? Yeah, I got a flood of support. I mean, people just came in from all over, especially other people with ADHD that came to me and they were like, I did not know that you had ADHD. I have this, but I haven't really talked to anyone about it. I don't really know how to deal with it. I've just kind of come up with my own, like like, I guess, compensatory strategies, that sort of thing. So it was great. And for me, it felt very freeing. It it just felt like, cool, this is a thing about myself that I try and hide so that I, I mean, for, for different reasons, you know, the world is not as accepting (laughs) and, um, and kind as this ADHD community, um, that I've found. Uh, so yeah, it, it made me feel really good. It made me feel really connected to people. And I would think that in the circles that you run in, it's probably pretty prevalent. Mm -hmm. And what I have heard over and over again is that (laughs) people will be really good friends and both of them will have ADHD, Mm -hmm. but they don't want to talk about it. And then when one of them talks about it, it's like, oh my God, I have that too. And I've I've not been talking about it because I was ashamed. So you you discover that you're friends with so many people that are like you. I mean, it makes sense. Like attracts like. Right. I remember um, when I, the time I first started really coming to terms with this and like wanting to talk about it was my friend Georgette, who was interviewed on my podcast, but is also the artistic director of my theater company. She has talked about having ADHD. And one time I remember us going to have lunch together and we just started swapping ADHD stories. And oh my gosh, it was like this huge amount of joy and connection and feeling like, oh, I don't have to hide that anymore. I don't have to hide how hard that is. And, you know, I always, I feel like every podcast interview I do, I mention this, but Brene Brown always says that shame only needs two things in a Petri dish to grow, and that's secrecy and silence. And once you start talking about it, it makes you feel good. I mean, I respect Georgette. Georgette's an amazing artist, director, like person. And for her to have some of the same experiences as me, it's like, yeah, okay. You know, I'm not broken. I just have these certain things I have to work a little harder at. And, um, It was just a really good feeling. And you have so many things that you do so much better than anyone else, certainly anyone that doesn't have ADHD that are, Mm -hmm. you know, those are your strengths, right? Right. Yeah. 
not often, but I do hear at times from parents who say, oh, my child has just been diagnosed and I don't want anybody to know. And, Mm. you know, the whole time, and I actually tell them this, but I'm thinking, why would you do that to your child? You're basically, they're going to find out, number one. Yeah. And then they're going to feel like, well, the reason you didn't say anything is because you're ashamed of it. Mm. And it's exactly what you just said, you know, Brene Brown's comment about what did you say about it, the, uh, about hiding it, right? Right. Yeah. The shame needs only secrecy and silence to grow. Yeah. I can totally relate to that. Okay. So <laughs> you mentioned that there are certain superpowers, ADHD superpowers, that tend to be bestowed on artists. Yeah. Give me some examples. Sure. So because I'm an actor, I'll just I'll just use that. So when I'm on stage nothing can get to me. I am incredibly focused. I'm so alive and present. It's insane. Like rehearsals are harder for me because it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many distractions. But I think it just allows you to tap into this like almost superhuman quality where you're like on stage and you feel like almost out of body and and like you're firing on all cylinders, right? So I think that's part of it that I feel. And I also think that when you have ADHD, my friend Brandon Tessers talks about this. So like we take in so much information, information about like someone's face, someone like a gesture, like what does that mean? What does this mean? And we're taking it all in and we don't have time to process it all. But when I'm working with a scene partner, I'm so focused on them. Like completely focused on them. And I think that actually makes for a more honest performance because nobody really wants to see, um, and this is my friend Brandon again, but nobody wants to see you go on stage and just be angry, right? That's boring. Like we've seen (laughs) angry before, like, oh, you know, I'm so mad. I'm just going to yell through this whole monologue. But if you're playing off the other person And taking in what they're doing and responding to that, you know, with your body, with potentially your voice, it keeps it alive, right? It makes it so much more um, exciting to watch. So that's definitely another thing. And I, yeah, I mean, there's been so many people uh, that have come on with art forms other than mine um, who will do like visual arts or something. and, And they're able to tap into this creativity and not overthink something necessarily. I mean, I guess they overthink it, but like sometimes they just make something impulsively and it's amazing and it's not overthought and maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's like gorgeous. And it's just, I don't know, it's, it's amazing to look at. So, so those are just some ideas that I have for superpowers, but the way I like to describe it is uh, the X-Men. So like the X-Men have these powers, right? but they don't know how to use them so they can be dangerous or just terrible. You know, they can be destructive and make them feel ashamed of it and whatever. But then they go to this school and they learn some like, they learn to hone these powers and then they can use them in a way that's like effective and helpful for them and for others. So that's kind of what I mean when I talk about like ADHD is having superpowers. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. You know, um, I just had Edward Hallowell on and one of the comments he made that I, I just love is that one of the things that we absolutely have to do with ADHD is create because basically, mm-hmm. you know, this nonlinear brain, it means that we're creative, maybe not in the you know traditional sense of what we think creativity is, you know, the arts, yeah. but we are definitely creative in, in how we take in information and what we do with it. And so his comment was, if we're not able to create, that is when we end up with, you know, addictions um, and just, you know, in bad addictive type behaviors. So it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. uh, My favorite question to ask on my podcast is, um, what does it feel like to make art? Mm -hmm. And the answers are just beautiful. It's just like, you know, it it makes me feel alive. It makes me feel like I'm in the right place. Like I, it makes me feel like I have wings. Um, you know, I, I just can't live without it. Um, 
it makes me depressed when I'm not doing it. Like, it's just, it's really amazing. I love that question so much. <laughs> it just makes you ta- think about the feeling rather than like, well, I make art because of this, 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 and this. Yeah. So who's been your most interesting guest? Oh, no. Was there someone that was just so fun and... Oh, God, I've had so many good ones. And I'm so like, I just love them all. And I just did my 10th episode. So it's like, I'm still, I'm still new. I'm trying to think. Well, I had uh, Stacy Michelle on, <laughs> who, is, who is a hoot, as I'm sure you know. And what I loved about her is I was laughing the whole time. Like my cheeks hurt <laughs> after that interview. And I just love what she's doing. She's got this um this YouTube channel called um ADHD is the new black. Yeah. And it's just really it's amazing. Uh, like what she's trying to do and she's a comedian and she's got this great story about um being like a news anchor and and having trouble with that and so so yeah, she's she is uh, so funny. So funny. Um and so creative. Mm-hmm. And for example, just how she takes those YouTube videos and creates them, I, uh, I have no, that is just not where my strengths lie. That's for yeah. sure. So I have <laughs> so much respect for, for what she does and how she's doing it because we all need to be out there in our different ways, getting the word out. Absolutely. I totally agree. And so I like, one of the reasons I wanted her, her to come on the podcast is I was like, this needs to have the signal boosted. You know, more people need to hear about this because she's doing some amazing work here. So, yeah, I mean, I, I loved totally all agree. my guests, but that, that was the one I laughed the hardest. in. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And all I kept thinking is, oh, my gosh, I can just imagine what she was like as a child. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would like to think I would be friends with her as a child, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you're also an executive function coach. Where did yeah. that come from? Maybe explain what an executive function coach is for those who might not know. And then how did you decide to to go in that direction? Yeah. So executive functioning is basically like the skills and strategies that you use to be able to take what's in your brain and put it into action. So what we do as a coach is, and how it differs from like therapy is therapy is much more based on finding patterns, looking at like a big picture or looking at the small picture and making it bigger. Like, here's a pattern here. This is a pattern and great. And like, let's explore this like trauma and stuff. And in executive functioning coaching, it's more deductive reasoning. So it's going to be like, take this big idea, this concept, this something you think about yourself, and we're going to narrow it down and focus in on how to do that. So we work with a lot of students. We work with artists, you know, that that come in saying, like, I just don't know why I can't get started. I just I mean, I hear that so much. It's like, I just don't know why I can't get started. I know what I need to do and I want to do it and I just can't. And so we really dig into, like, why that's happening. Can we lower the cost of doing that so it makes it easier so that's kind of what we do. And the, the how I fell into it is um, when I started the podcast, the ADHD Artist Podcast, I just started kind of diving into the world, the community online, especially of um, like neurodiversity, um, ADHD in particular. But so my friend Brandon Tessers is a playwright <laughs> that I know in Chicago that was working with my theater company. And I found out after I started the podcast, that he works with people that consider themselves neurodivergent and or creative. So I had him come on as kind of like a consultant, so I didn't say anything stupid (laughs) or or like spread misinformation. And so we started talking and uh, it turns out that he was starting his own practice called Effective Artistry. And we got along really well and he really liked all the stuff I was doing. And he was like, you would be this amazing coach. I would love to you know, bring you on for this new practice. And so then it just kind of started and we got you know, training and, um, you know, I've, I've, I have some clients now and it's growing. My knowledge base is growing and uh, it's really great. So I wouldn't have been doing this if not for starting that podcast and uh, coming out <laughs> as ADHD, I guess. 
Wow. And that's a perfect testimony to speak out. You know, once we get on our platform, it's just amazing who we have the opportunity to meet, right? Yeah. And then that just allows us to be who we've always been meant to be. So it just feels good. It does. It's like, you know, sometimes you're looking for this perfect job, but (laughs) there's this idea that the perfect job you're looking for doesn't necessarily exist yet (laughs) or or you don't know about it yet. So do you, you know, just be you and and shout it out loud and and see, you know, find your tribe that way and, and things fall into place. Okay, last question before Mm -hmm. I let you go. Mm -hmm. What do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? Finding your support system. Surrounding yourself with people that feel safe, that you can talk to about the things that you may be ashamed of. Um, This is especially when you've moved to a new city, state, country, like find your tribe, find your people, because otherwise you're just going to be pretending, you know, you're just going to be pretending to be something you're not um, and hiding the things that you don't think other people want. So that's really important. And then I think just trying things out that work for you, not things like should work for you, because that's not as helpful, right? Like, why doesn't this work for me? I tried all these things. Find the things that actually work for you to get you to do the thing and follow your passion. I mean, I know that I I wish that my passion was more lucrative sometimes, (laughs) you know, like, oh, I just happened to to do this thing that's going to make me a billionaire. But um, especially artists like make your art, make your art. And it really does help. Absolutely. If we're not creative, we get into trouble. Yep, exactly. Sarah, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? Sure. Um, I mean, I would love for people to check out the ADHD Artist podcast. I've got some really great interviews coming up. And then my theater company, Interrobang Theater Project, um, is doing a, an all-virtual season, which is sad because I miss being in the live theater. But what's cool about it is that um, it brings in a bigger audience because anyone anywhere can can tune in. So we've got a couple things coming up, including um, over the summer. We're, so we're doing this solo series for ensemble members. And I am writing a piece about my family, something that happened in my family and and like how we view illness and, and um, how sometimes we make choices that can influence generations to come. So I'm I'm very nervous about this, but I'm writing a piece um, that's very personal to me. So that'll come out in in June. So you can check that out um, on the Interbang website, which I'll send you. Um, Perfect. Yeah. And I'll have all of the links in the show notes. So if yeah. anybody can't write it down right now because you're in your car or you're <laughs> running, just go to our show notes. So Sarah, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having this me. This was fun. It was fun. <laughs> And that is what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Sarah, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And you know, your reviews really help in that regard. So please go to I guess it's Apple Podcasts, right? And leave us a review if you like what we're doing. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me a message there. Don't forget to sign up for my free five-day workshop, How to Fall in Love with Your ADHD Brain at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash ilovemybrain.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. 
Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.